Hello and welcome to The Organ Show with me, Cheryl Enever. And me, Andrew Palmley. We hope you enjoyed last night's show and particularly our fantastic recital from All Saints Margaret Street by Stephen Farr. And this is just a quick reminder that his recital will only be available for 24 more hours. Uh, so don't miss it. Now, several viewers have written in to ask why we sometimes seem to start the show with a third person behind us looking through a window. Well, let me explain. This is not a window. It's the organ console, the part of the instrument where the player sits. So now we'll show you what I mean on a different camera. Only a superhuman person could manage such a control desk. So let me introduce you to tonight's superhuman uh, guest improviser, Dr. Ronnie Kripner, the organist of Croydon Minster. Good evening, Ronnie. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so far this week we've had a grand total of 18,000 viewers looking at the organ show and we're deeply grateful to you all for doing so. Uh, James O'Donnell with his film about Westminster Abbey at the minute tops the poll with 6,000 viewings. So Ronnie, there is absolutely no pressure. <laughs> Now, by now, you know how this works. Later in the show, we will invite Ronnie to improvise on one of three themes, but he'll only find out which theme just before he plays. The themes for tonight are, what shall we do with a drunken sailor? Thank you, Ronnie. That was marvellous. And the second one is The Weller Man. And the third is Leave Her Johnny. Oh, marvellous. I'm not sure that I uh, recognise all those themes, but beautifully, <laughs> beautifully articulated, Ronnie. Thank you very much. We'll be back to you very soon. But first, we're going to play a visit to Bista, to the showroom of uh, the Viscount Classical Organ Company, and to have a word with David Mason. David Mason, a great friend of the Royal College of Organists. Good afternoon, and welcome on this lovely sunny day to the showroom here in Bista. Follow me through to the... Before we move into the showroom on my right, where there are nine models from the Viscount range, I thought we'd just briefly take a look at this rather delightful digital chamber organ built by our sister company, Region Classic. So, moving now to my right, depending on your view of the technology, you will either enter the world of organ heaven, or if you consider it controversial, perhaps organ hell. As the camera pans around, you will see just a small selection of instruments from the Viscount range of over 30 different models. These range from single manual portable keyboards to substantial four manual instruments, and almost every conceivable option in between. We have 15 instruments in these showrooms, and many more with regional retailers throughout the UK and Ireland. We also custom make instruments to our associate company, Region Classic Organs. From these facilities in Leicester, thanks to the Region of the Internet, we also send instruments all over the world. I think we will all agree that the future of the organ is a little fragile. 
and the pandemic has not helped this cause. So we're especially active assisting schools putting the organ onto their musical curriculum. The organ has a huge secular contribution to make and what better place to start that than in our schools. And now it's time for us to find out what theme Ronnie's going to improvise on. So I'm going to grab one envelope from Morwenna here. Um, I'll take the middle one this time. And let's see. It is The Wellerman. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the theme tune for tonight is going to be The Wellerman. Uh, many of you will recognise this tune as uh, a tune of great importance in recent times, a sea shanty at heart. And tonight, uh, it's to be improvised on by the organist of Croydon Minster, Dr. Ronnie Krippner. Ronnie, you've got four minutes and you're starting now.
Um, today is our CO Education Day and we're delighted that we've been able to bring together a panel of experts in the field of organ education and we're going to drop in on a conversation between them all led by Anna Lapwood. And between the segments of that conversation we've got three very interesting short films for you. We're going to visit a very talented young musician based in Geneva, but today playing on the organ of Canterbury Cathedral, of course, a World Heritage Site. We'll also see James Mitchell, winner of the Under-25 Royal College of Organist Composition competition, uh, playing his piece, Festival to Carter. And for those of you who've been wondering just what is our theme tune this week, well, we shall also have a short interview between Anna Latwood and Sir Carl Jenkins, because our theme tune this week is Sir Carl Jenkins' own piece, Celebratio, played for us by RCO member and member of the academic board, Ghislaine Rees Trapp. Welcome to Education Day. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this education panel for the RCO Organ Show. I don't think we're going to have a shortage of things to talk about. There is a lot to cover. So I'd love to just actually jump straight in and start by asking Tom Bell if you could tell us a little bit about some of the ways in which the RCO has been engaging with young people. Well, there's a whole different bunch of levels that we work at. And of course, um, this past year has been quite an interesting opportunity to slightly reinvent certain things and to, to work online. Um, but I think the, the primary most exciting thing is, is the, the courses we work um, on, the courses we lead with groups of students uh, in a particular location with a bunch of top-notch uh, teachers and so on and so forth. They're always really wonderful, not just for the teaching they provide, but for the building of community and the connections that are made between those young organists. Because it, it can be quite an isolating experience in an organ office, as, as everybody here knows, it's something you do on your own quite a lot of the time. And um, so that's one thing. And then there's just all the online content we've been providing um, both before and during COVID on IRCO videos and webinars and so on and so forth, lots of things that people can engage with uh, digitally. Um, and obviously our program of classes that also takes place. I mean, there, there are other things as well. I mean, we've recently been working at accrediting institutions. So not just accrediting teachers, but accrediting, accrediting particular institutions um, their organ culture, not just the teaching itself, but the fact that it might be that it's supported at the highest level, that there's a community there of people playing the instrument. And there are a number of institutions which have got on board just in, in recent weeks, Blue Coat School in Liverpool being one, the junior RNCM being another, Radley College being another, and various other schools and other institutions. So there's a lot going on that connects with young people in different ways. Uh, but obviously we, we look forward to doing ever more. I would love to take a very brief uh, visit to Scotland and ask Andrew McIntosh if you could tell us a little bit about the Scottish organists training scheme that you're involved with and how that kind of interacts with the RCO. Uh, sure, so Scott, uh, which is the Scottish Church's organist training scheme, is a, uh, a, a, a partnership between the RCO and a number of other organisations, the Scottish Churches, the Scottish Federation of Organists, which is the umbrella body for the IEO local societies in Scotland, um, and the RSCM. Uh, so it's really everybody who's involved with uh, the organ on, on the ground in Scotland. And it's a, a scheme which provides support for those unexpected organists that, that we were talking about before, uh, who find themselves playing in churches, either uh, the people who have been playing for a long time, who've uh, never had any uh, formal tuition or people who are pianists or who have other um, uh, musical backgrounds and who've been, uh, uh, you know, had their arm twisted because they happen to be there and because uh, somebody's found out that they're musical and, and they don't have anybody to play the organ. And, and so what it does is it provides a, a, a structured scheme by which uh, you can uh, have have your playing and, and not just your repertoire playing but your liturgical skills accredited by by a, a three stages of assessment but also uh, you have support you're, you're matched up with an advisor who is somebody locally who is not necessarily your organ teacher or who is emphatically not your organ teacher but is simply somebody who's there to, to hold your hand give you a bit of support mm -hmm. And then uh, sitting alongside that is a series of local organ workshops which take place throughout the year where people come along and uh, there's various themed sessions on aspects of uh, registration or choosing hymns or playing hymns and uh, you know all these building blocks 
that the you know people may not have encountered at all and and you know they they're very grateful to uh, to have the opportunity to learn more something that we've just been working on in the last few months is a it's an idea we've called it project organ world um it's a sort of working title but some people seem to like it so maybe that's what it will stay as um but something that's occurred to the rco uh, and other people who commented on this is that okay so we've now got this amazing digital resource in the shape of irco where we can provide um webinars or whatever it is video content for people who if you like are inside the tent you, you have you have to be a, a sort of a card carrying member of the organ community um, to, to know that IRCA even exists. Now, what, what we're working on creating is a website that will be full of commissioned material of all different kinds, uh, that is for people outside the tent. And uh, so that might be um, material for use in schools that is not about the organ necessarily, but use the organ as a tool, for example, for the science curriculum, as well as obviously, yes, musical stuff that uh, introduces the organ to people in the classroom and sort of slightly sort of normalizes it, if you like. Uh, but there'll also be sections on getting started and um, showing a person who perhaps is completely on their own out in Oban, but they've not, they've missed the Scots uh, event over there or, 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 you know, in rural Kent where I used to teach people who were completely out of the loop in, in terms of the organ. Work. <laughs> The Liverpool Blue Coat School is a co-educational, non-fee-paying, selective state grammar school founded in 1708. It is believed to be the only UK state school to have two pipe organs, an 1875 Father Willis organ, and the school chapel's smaller 1906 Walker organ. <laughs> A grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund allowed the school to restore its historic Willis organ and at the same time establish the Organ Scholarship Program. The students are taught not only on the two fine organs in the school, but also on these organs' big brothers. Liverpool Anglican Cathedral's huge Willis organ, the biggest in the UK, and Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral's magnificent Walker organ. It is hoped that the organ scholarships will attract a diverse range of students as well as increase the number of female players in a male-dominated area of music. Yeah, it's really amazing. It was quite a surprising opportunity, but when it came up, I was really glad to take it. I think it's really important to keep the tradition alive, especially amongst young kids. You play on such like a small part, but you can hear it all around you. It's quite magical. <laughs> Lots of people don't get the opportunity, and the fact that I do just makes me so happy. As part of the restoration of the Willis organ, students learned how organs are constructed, making trips to the organ company's shop and helping them set the organ back up in the hall. The school even recreated the 1904 removal of the organ by horse and dray from the old city center school site to its new building. plans to use the restored Father Willis organ for community outreach schemes, such as public organ and choral concerts, and workshops for primary and specialist school students.
school hopes that by combining its own organ resources with those of the two great Liverpool cathedrals, a superb national music training opportunity for young people will be created, and the new generation of organ players will recharge a great British tradition. My name is Oscar Collier, I'm 17, and I'm currently the Organ Scholar at the King's School in Canterbury. I am an offer holder to read music at Trinity College Cambridge in October, where I'll also be taking up the Organ Scholarship. I'm delighted to bring to you from the mountains of Switzerland, where I'm currently confined, a piece recorded a few months ago on the brand new organ in Canterbury Cathedral. <laughs> that has also changed recently is the move to doing everything online. I realise most recently that has been a forced move, um, but it's been really lovely seeing so many different organists embracing the online culture. And I wonder, William, if I can just ask you a little bit about everything you're doing with sharing uh, these amazing recitals and pieces on YouTube. It, well, it's been one of those um, 
very easy things to do. I'm lucky to have access to a cathedral organ. So I've been, uh, whenever I've been in, I've been doing the odd little little recording. But of course, it uh, has the capabilities of, of, of reaching an audience that would never have considered either listening to organ music. And of course, it extends to all other forms of music as well. But uh, now I, I, I feel as if in a very small way, what with uh, recording small nuggets of re repertoire and also uh, my uh, fun and games with him sing along most weeks, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, a completely different audience uh, have, have been uh, introduced to a, a quite extraordinary instrument. And I hope that kind of uh media attention or or use of social media continues i know it's not to everyone's cup of tea but uh, for for me and the reactions that i've got it's been absolutely tremendous i was just going to say i think i think the organ's been one of the most successful instruments in the in the last year in terms of online performances I and mean, william your series to name one of many and i just would be interested in in how colleagues are going to carry on using I mean we, we're in such a great position now um, to carry on that energy to carry on those visual things and, and indeed to carry on sharing things online so that people don't have to come to to a particular church I think we're in such a great great position to do that. Um, I don't know if any of the RCO team was going to mention this, but um, the RCO was kind enough to ask Frederick and me to run classes in teaching keyboard skills. And I know there've been other classes online, but of course teaching keyboard skills is fantastic on Zoom. Um, if you can hear the students, which of course is sometimes a challenge, um, but um, it's like having a keyboard studio. And the students have really benefited, I think, from uh, working through our greater keyboard musicianship books um, which I just put in a marketing thing, start right at the bottom, grade one, um, and go up to um, pre-diploma level. Um, it's been so lovely for them to be able to work on their own keyboards uh, throughout the class. But also, of course, when we come back to the visibility thing, it's so important too for organists to meet each other. And that's just been a little opportunity for them to make contact during a difficult year. Let's move now to think a little bit about teaching and Tom Allery, what have the challenges been of being an organ teacher in recent years? And I guess the positives as well, because there must be positives too. I think for me, the challenge is, I mean, I, I teach at, um, at two schools, which are n newly uh, accredited schools, at Radley College and also at City of London School. And um, there, I think the challenge has been how to engage people of all different levels. It's um, it's easy to engage your um, your students who are, are high flyers and maybe come to us with a lot of piano experience, keyboard skills, notational skills. Um, but for me, the challenge is kind of at the at the lower end, how to engage. Um, people who maybe don't want to go on and take it to an organ scholarship or take it to uh, and, and to play in a church, for example. Many of us as organists enjoy exploring, uh, I was going to say new repertoire, I don't mean contemporary repertoire necessarily, I just mean um, music we haven't explored, going off into the byways and perhaps overdoing some of that repertoire in, in our recitals. Uh, um, and not thinking of how that's going to be received by an audience who perhaps for many of them it's their first organ recital or if they do go to organ recitals they don't have a particular knowledge it's easier to assume um, that they're going to be as interested in the byways of italian renaissance repertoire as we might be we of course want to be tremendously enthusiastic about getting people involved to start getting them started but of course it is that huge transition isn't it from you know just that initial banging away on the organ and loving the sounds to actually beginning to play and I don't know as a I mean as a piano teacher I always found it a huge struggle really getting people from nothing to grade one and even um, with the organ you know the challenge is even greater so it's really finding that those early levels isn't it so that, that's what Anne and I have spent the last few years trying to achieve in our tutor really finding that early repertoire the step-by-step -step repertoire that people can use 
Um, Frederick and I uh, cooked up the idea of the um, the beginner's tutor. Uh, how long ago, Frederick? Two, three years, four years? I can't quite remember now. It was a long time. Um, and um, conscious that students like to play pieces, uh, the whole book is designed around 20 pieces in finely graded order. And that and choosing the pieces, of course, was the main challenge because we had to cover all the major styles, have them in graded order, um, gradual increase of pedal activity, and indeed manual technique. Um, and the whole, each chapter leads to the piece. And then Frederick, being a professional composer, of course, um, composed three little studies to follow each piece, each study picking up one of the uh, one of the topics taught within that chapter. So those studies not only are lovely little pieces in their own right, but also uh, useful as revision pieces and uh, for sight reading um, and uh, tick so many boxes, really. Um, I, I find them extremely useful, certainly in my teaching. My name's Tim Morris and I've been the organist at Radley College, which is a boys' private school near Oxford, for the last 25 years, amazingly. I thought I'd talk a little bit about my life as an organist here and how it forms part of the Radley community and what we like to offer to our boys here. Um, I started out here actually almost by accident. I had been organ scholar at New College in Oxford. I stayed there to do a doctorate and, like a lot of people, I think, uh, certainly uh, my friends, took a little bit longer than the amount of time I had funding for, so I ran out of money. So I got a part-time job at Radley playing the organ. And uh, what I found about it was that I really enjoyed the variety of things we did here. So one obvious and, you know, sort of predictable part of this is accompanying the choir, playing the organ for services and things at Radley. That's been challenging over the years. It certainly kept me busy. Anything from sort of Durifle Requiem or we did a performance of Stephen Montague's Behold the Pale Horse with Onyx Brass early in my time here, which is the only piece I've ever actually drawn blood practising. <laughs> organ at Radley for all of that time has been a bit of a mixed blessing if I'm honest. It's, um, it was built in 1980 by Hill, Norman and Beard. It was a Baroque style tracker instrument, not something that went used to tracker actions and that was one of its weaknesses. The action's always been rather heavy. The um, Baroque style of it works fine for teaching but it's way too quiet for the boys singing. In fact almost immediately that organ, that organ was opened in 1980 they realised it was too quiet. They actually built an East End organ at the other end of chapel to supplement it for the hymns. In the last few years, we've really developed the organ as well. What we did was to appoint an assistant organist for the first time. David Quinn was the first, who's now at Bradfield. And that meant that we could build up the organ teaching a bit. We had a second organ teacher. And as I said, we've now got uh, the very happy situation of having an assistant organist, Rory Moles, and a visiting organ teacher, Tom Allery, as well. Tom gives us a contact into the organ world outside, he's active as a continuate player and teaching in other schools and, and in working in London as a director of music and that sort of thing, which is great because for our little isolated world in Radley, it's very easy to end up um, not really be having much contact with the outside world. So all of that's been tremendously exciting. The number of organ pupils is on the up, despite not having a particularly great organ. Now we're building a fantastic new organ as well, and things really are picking up. We have an organ scholarship program in the sixth form, and uh, we have a bastion organ scholar in post at the moment who's planning to um, hopefully go off to university as an organ scholar. He's ARCO at the moment and that kind of thing.
look at the examinations, um, the diploma examinations, um, you know, at their best, we're hoping that they have the right sort of ethos, that people are seeing the connections between the component parts. They're seeing the connections between the um, playing, the repertoire performance, and then the skills, and then also the written work. And, and the written work, I think, is very much sort of a traditional British view, hopefully updated, but a traditional British view of theory as the observation of practice. So we're, we're trying to get people to, to look at a variety of models and to understand what they're playing and what they're trying to perform from the point of view of contrapuntal techniques and harmonic language, uh, and, and also historical inquiry. And with historical inquiry comes critical inquiry. You know, it's understanding compositional techniques and styles, uh, but it's also understanding something of the context as well, something of the, of the reception and the, and the environment of which music has, has evolved in particular ways for particular reasons. So I think that holistic view of the diplomas uh, we're very keen to emphasize, and I think we've always had that but hopefully what we have now is a kind of um you know 2021 version of that 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 comprehensive ethos of interconnected skills critical inquiry and performance and performance practices that are associated with that well i wanted to raise the point about um statistics uh if you think about those who self-identify as organists through the organizations like the rco through bios the organ club through the various regional organist associations, we've perhaps got something like four to 5,000 people. But we reckon the people who actually encounter the organ uh, beyond that might take it up to something like seven and a half thousand, eight thousand people. And that would include those that we now call the unexpected organists. Um, they used to be called the reluctant organists, but they're now the unexpected organists, which I think is a nicer way of of, of um, uh, analyzing that particular constituency. So, of course, the RCO is very keen on uh, introducing the organ to youngsters, but we're also very conscious of those unexpected organists, uh, of those people in their communities who have an interest in the organ, perhaps don't feel that they can self-identify as organists, um, but you know we need to nurture them as well. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly uh, underline something that Andrew McRae said there about the, this term that we, we use now of the unexpected organist rather than the reluctant organist. Because I think the reality is that a lot of people that we used to view as being reluctant are nothing of the kind. They may have stumbled into organ playing by an unconventional route or because somebody found out they were a pianist and we need an organist and, and we need you to play. But in fact, they are very enthusiastic and, and they want to learn. Well, Carl, thank you so much for agreeing to come and chat to us for the RCO Organ Week. I look forward to hearing all about your organ piece, Celebratio, in a second. But before that, I had no idea that your father was an organist and a choir trainer. Uh, yes, he was a, a chapel organist. Um, and a, and a choir master of the chapel choir. Um, so that was part of my upbringing. And uh, he played the organ in the, in the chapel, um, which I played occasionally. I mean, I can't, can't play with the feet <laughs> or I don't understand the registrations. Um, so I seek advice on, on those kind of things. But as a pianist, I sometimes used to go down with, with him when he used to go and play. And I used to have a little dabble on the keyboards and can quite enjoy it. But I think that is so often the way that young organists actually start. It's just someone happening to be at an organ and say to them, actually, here you go, sit down, play your piano piece and just have some fun because it is one of those instruments where it is so naturally fun to play and pulling out all the different stops and discovering all the different Yes, sounds. it is, absolutely. That's what I used to do. But the odd thing is that many people don't realise, unlike piano playing, when you take your finger off the note, the note stops. There's no sustained pedal. Mm. So the play, playing is more... Um, one's playing has to be more disciplined in a way to make sure that the notes are held down, you know, rather than... Well, it's a different technique, mm. um, but um, that's, that's the first thing. And all modern synthesizers are like that, or most of them. 
you know. It's wonderful. And I, I guess also um, you talk about the sort of congregational singing being such a huge part of it. I know that you've written so many pieces for so many different configurations of instruments and voices, but I, I guess if you were sort of looking at your most popular ones, they tend to be choral works or pieces that involve choirs. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, it's kind of odd because I never, never sang really, um, other than when I was very young. But when I was a, of an age to, to play an instrument, I played the oboe. And very often I played in orchestras when people were singing, in youth orchestras, uh, those kind of things. Uh, and the National Youth Orchestra of, of Wales. Um, but uh, it's when I started, I've always been a musical tourist in many ways. After university in the Royal Academy, I worked as a jazz musician for a while. And, I wrote media music, um, from which I learned quite a lot, strangely, mm -hmm. uh, in having to write different styles of music for different and different genres of music for commercial uh, commercial films. Um, and when I was doing that, there was many celebrated, uh, who were later celebrated film directors were were shooting commercials like Ridley Scott and Alan Parker and um, Hugh Hudson. Um, and these were, as I say, before they graduated, graduated to, uh, to the cinema, as mm. it were. Um, so all these different influences went into the, into the melting pot and came out in what I, when I reinvented myself when I was about 50, <laughs> and found what I could, what I was best at, which uh, wasn't jazz or anything like that. It was um, writing accessible, what I like to think of as accessible, or tonal music anyway for, for, for choirs. Um, but you are so, you're so right about it being accessible because I mean I was sort of brought up on a diet of your music when I was going through school I was singing it and playing it in orchestra. Oh great. And well, I think the thing that I, if I sort of had to think of a defining characteristic to all of it is that it's extremely enjoyable to play and perform whatever your age there's a way there's a way in and that's certainly the case with celebratio as well i mean i played it myself and it's such fun to play that piece yes the idea stemmed from um i wrote a, uh it was a it was a bbc ident uh when they opened the welsh assembly uh, and that was for the bbc or uh, national Orchestra of wales it wasn't long it was like a minute or, or, or less even um so the germ of the musical idea for, for the organ piece came from that. And I kind of developed it and, and changed it changed it a bit. I can't remember who played it first. I think it was Hugh Tregellis Williams, who's an organist in South Wales, and also uh, he was head of music at the BBC at one, mm -hmm. at one time. I'd love to ask you just one, one last question. And this is actually on behalf of one of the girls that I teach, who is fascinated with composition. She loves writing herself. And um, whenever she has the opportunity to speak to a composer, she will always ask them what it is they think gives music the ability to um, encourage emotional responses. I realize it's not a, a small question at all, but she says, why is it when I listen to certain pieces, I feel sad? Why is it that when I hear other pieces, I feel immense joy? I wonder if you have any thoughts. Well, one, one critic said of me in a deprecating way that I was um, emotionally manipulative <laughs> as a composer, <laughs> which I thought was, a, I took that to be a tremendous compliment, although he didn't mean it as such. <laughs> um, and I, I really don't know. I mean, my, my composing is based on, it's intuition based on a lot of craft learned at university. Uh, I read music in Cardiff, so which is very academic, harmony, counterpoint, field goal, that stuff. I think Melvin Bragg once said, if it, if it has memorability and longevity, then it's it's art, he said, or worth something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not any making claims in that direction, but um, I write from the heart, and a lot of people seem to like it. So uh, <laughs> that's all I can say. I mean, I'm thoroughly modest in what I do. I mean, we all, as they say, stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before, um, you know, and uh, my heroes are composers of genius, genius like Mahler or Richard Strauss or Bach, and, you know, people, people like that. Mm. Uh, 
And because I, I, I work in different genres, I was in, I like jazz music a lot. Uh, so I'm a bit of an all-rounder, as they say. Well, can I thank the members of our education panel tonight, Thomas Allery, Tom Bell, uh, Andrew McRae, Andrew McIntosh, Anne Marston Thomas, William Saunders, the RCO Young Persons Czar, Frederick Stogan, uh, Simon Williams, and of course, all moderated and uh, corralled by Anna Latwood. Now, that was a fantastic piece by Sir Carl Jenkins, and I'm delighted that so many people have discovered that piece this week through the Auburn Show. Let me tell you, this is not advertising, that it's available from Boozy and Hawks. Uh, now, for another fantastic piece, as I mentioned earlier, James Mitchell's Festival to Carter. And then we shall have a brief visit to Eton College to our old friend David Good, who will be uh, introducing us to a rather unusual performance of Lang's Tuba Tune. Hi, I'm James. I'm currently the organ scholar at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. And I'll be playing my Festival Toccata, which won the under-25 category in the RCO Composition Competition. I hope you enjoy!
I'm David Good, and I'm organist here at Eton. And it's a terrific pleasure to be part of International Organ Day. Uh, we thought here at the school we might uh, have fun with a little project, a joint project, uh, because we've got quite a lot of uh, boys learning the organ. And so what we've done is to uh, divide up the much-loved Lang tuba tune uh, into little sections, and we've each uh, recorded uh, a bit. Uh, so I hope uh, that'll prove enjoyable. There's a slight irony uh, here. I'm uh, standing in front of um, our largest instrument uh, in our college chapel, um, which is a, a wonderful uh, 1902 hill with uh, a very fine tuba. However, uh, a few days ago, uh, we discovered that the blower is uh, not working very well at all. And so we can't actually run this organ, tuba or anything uh, at the moment uh, at all. So um, it, all these clips are in, on different organs, um, uh, mainly our lower chapel organ, um, but you'll also see a 18th century um, Snetzler chamber organ that I'll be playing and uh, one or two other uh, sort of humbler instruments um, around the school. But um, apart from the lack of a tuba, I hope uh, you enjoy uh, the tuba tune. And uh, here to kick it off is uh, my colleague, the presenter and director of music, Tim Johnson. And now for something completely different. Well, Christoph, thank you so much for agreeing to come and talk to me for the RCO Organ Week. I'm so excited to hear more about this amazing model, which I can see behind you. But before that, could you sort of explain a little bit about who you are and how you got to this point of building these incredible Lego organs? Uh, well, I'm, I'm an engineer and uh, I like to play, I like to construct. And uh, it turns out my, my father was an organist on a very famous Schnitger organ. Um, and uh, so someday, actually two years ago, uh, I combined those two uh, habits uh, or traits. And uh, it was the year when uh, uh, Schnitger had its, his uh, 300 year anniversary of his death. <laughs> Um, so I decided to build a Schnitger organ out of Lego and um, that's what I came up with. So how long does it actually take to build something like that? Because I mean I, I used to love Lego but I confess I never came up with anything that looked remotely like that. 
Well, that's um, a tricky question and a good one as well. Uh, I am continuously building. So it's just on uh, a couple of days ago, I added something more to this model and I realized I can do even more. So I ordered new bricks and when they arrive, I will change the model again. So it's, uh, it stretches over years. Um, for the basic model, let's say I took about four months Wow. Yeah, you can have a sneak peek. And uh, I put it here for a minute. Since it's modular, as Schnittger used to build his organs, this model is as well, the main works. And the, here, for example, I will probably change the, the prospect pipes soon, since they come up with a new silver ink uh, color at Lego. <laughs> it makes it even shinier. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> so, and here you have all the pipes in there. Wow. And the uh, um, wind chest down here. Golly. A actually, here you have the ab abstract, we call them, the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And yeah. here we have the next one. And here you not only see the, all the pipes, you see the wind channel. Here are some, uh, not stopper action, the other one um, for the registers. Um, yeah. And here you have the um, mechanics again. <laughs> so how do you actually put that together? Because the pieces are so tiny. I mean, do you have to use tweezers or can you just do it with your hands? No, you can do it with your fingers. Gosh, wow. It's. Uh, well, they are small, but they're not that small. Yeah. That's, and next thing we have is your place of work. <laughs> oh, I love the, I love the stop knobs. They're gorgeous. And the little music on there as well. Yes. And a, and a to-do list, what's on your rehearsal checklist as well. That's just bark, 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 bark. <laughs> <laughs> It is. Uh, the funny thing about the stoppers is uh, those are actually microphones. Really? And they are different. Uh, it's the same microphone, but they come with a, a silver, golden, or without a topping. I agree. So I can make the distinguishment for which works uh, they are, actually. Gosh. You can see the black ones are the main, the main stoppers. So this organ is made out of four works. The rear works, main works, chest work, no, how do you call the small one? Chest work. And the uh, pedal. Wow. And I like to see that it's a straight pedal board there as well. Of course. <laughs> it's, it's a bit, the rest of it is <laughs> actually here. So together you would have. Um, Gosh, that's extraordinary. It's like this. So that was that was sort of your your first um, organ project for Lego, but now you're you've done another one, and actually the hope is that that might be commercially released. Is that right? Yes, that's right. What um, would need to happen for that to uh, that to actually take place? Uh, we need to to gather some more uh, votes on Lego Ideas, which is a crowdsourcing platform from Lego where you can uh, make proposals for new models. And in case they get 10,000 votes on this platform, uh, Lego actually is thinking about uh, building them. Um, but since this one is uh, huge, uh, much too, too big for Lego ideas, um, I scaled it down a bit, that then it's small enough. It's a resemblance of the um, organ, which is housed in the museum in Munich. I have here a complete model of the of the small one the one that is uh, at lego ideas and this time i can show you actually around so you can see the pedal is behind the organ and yeah. then you have um the the bellows and this time we can do something like let's only show you this And you can see some of the details in there. 
for convincing the next generation of uh, organ kids, this would be great. Completely. I think so much of what we talk about as organists is trying to make the organ something which they encounter in everyday life. And this yep. is the perfect way to do that, actually, because all kids play. Well, I hope all kids play with Lego. But it's not just kids that like playing with Lego. Our producer and his lady friend spent all Easter Sunday afternoon completing this. So let me explain how you can help Christophe Rouguet. You can vote for this online um, at legoideas.com. And if we get 10,000 votes, Lego will actually consider producing it commercially. And then you could buy your own. Well, that's amazing. And just in case our, our viewers are mystified as to who Christophe Rouguet may be, he's the designer of this organ, which actually is a miniature replica of the organ in the St. Jacobi Church, and we should be visiting that church tomorrow during International Organ Day. Now, I'm delighted that we're joined uh, this evening in the studio by Morwenna Campbell-Smith, who was our announcer last night for Stephen Farr's recital from All Saints, uh, Margaret Street at Morwenna. Welcome. Um, and how was last night for you? It was amazing to be the one member of the audience actually in the church hearing the organ in the building it was designed for and that wonderful organ just fits that acoustic like a glove. It's just wonderful. And I think what it says is that when this pandemic is over, when we can go to concerts, go and hear the organ live in the building. It's this thing they tell us as organists that we're playing the building, not just the instrument. And it was so very true last night. Of course, our, our president, Gerard Brooks, who improvised for us on, on day one, uh, is always telling all this, get over the fact that we play, actually go and listen to somebody else play. And it's very important to listen. Stevie's recital was well worth listening to yesterday. Yes, it, it, was, it, it, it was amazing. And what was so extraordinary was the range of colours, and I do hope this came over, even on YouTube, was the range of colours and with that organ it's never too it's never too loud it's never strident I mean it has enormous full sound you can sort of almost feel it in your body when you're listening but it's not it's not strident it's not harsh and yet when he was playing those very very quiet pianissimo parts in Cecilia McDowell's piece you could hear them it was like lots of little jewels in the air uh, in that church it was it was a wonderful experience well, I spoke to him today and he was pleased with his performance. Now, as you know only too well, at the start of the transfer from this place, St Paul's Knightsbridge, to your place, All Saints, Margaret Street, uh, we had a technical problem and we fell into silence for a while. Now, certainly Cheryl and I had a moment of panic, but what was happening at your end? <laughs> well, you know, when the line, when the line dropped, uh, my feeling was that those those designers, these architects and designers and builders of that beautiful Victorian interior were getting their own back on us, <laughs> but filling it full of gizmos and wires and cameras and little boxes and making a complete mess of that interior with modern bits and pieces. So, well, it was very nerve-wracking. And of course, Stephen 
was in that little box, that weird little box with the grill around it, sitting at the console, completely the opposite side of the church compared with us. We were in the vestry. Um, so I was running backwards and forwards, and Stephen was saying, what's happening? Are we on? What's happening? And I was running backwards and forwards across the church and, say, and, and, and reassuring him that we were doing what we could do. So eventually, of course, we did persuade the technology to work. <laughs> to behave, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that recital is available online for a further 24 hours. Uh, it was stunning. Our chief examiner, Stephen Farr, uh, playing a marvellous uh, programme. And do have a look at it if you've got the chance. Uh, so as we come toward, toward the end of our penultimate programme in the organ show, I, uh, can I remind you that if you're interested in the organ in any way, then our strap line is the rather cheesy, we are the first stop for every organist. If you're interested in us, then, uh, if you'd like to join the Royal College of Organists or make a donation, or find out anything at all, please go to rco.org.uk slash support. Uh, and can I remind you of one other thing, which is we are going to put together uh, a 2022 RCO calendar, and we'd love you to submit your photographs to be considered uh, to be part of that thing. So if you'd like to be uh, Miss January or Mr. February, let me have your photograph, please. Now. Uh, can I turn to Cheryl and ask what's on the menu tomorrow, please? Well, tomorrow we have films from literally, almost literally, <laughs> every corner of the globe. And uh, we've got David Briggs improvising for us, but not here. He's going to be playing um, in the largest cathedral in the world, St John the Divine in Manhattan. And the thing I'm really excited about, we've got the choir of St Paul's Knightsbridge uh, singing Kodai's late masterpiece, Laudes Organi. Um, so, it's quite a good show tomorrow, I think. Well, you know, yeah. I, uh, what I'd like to say is, what is there not to like? Quite. So, ladies and gentlemen, with thanks to Cheryl, with thanks to Morwenna and the technical team here at St Paul's Knightsbridge, good night. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow when we invite you to tune in and be inspired.